Have you ever wondered how unpressurized aircraft with limited range made it from the United States to Europe for World War II? Or for that matter, how does a new ordered general aviation aircraft cross the Atlantic? Today we're going to explore the North Atlantic Ferry Route, which was created in World War II. Welcome to Flight Brothers FT, produced by Tim and Lee. Plan the flight and fly the plan. All charts courtesy of Navigraph Charts, not to be used for real-world navigation. Be sure to subscribe and explore the rest of the channel for high-quality aviation content and entertainment. So welcome, Sim Captains. I'm Tim. And I'm Lee. So today we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, rather than just a single flight or a specific tutorial, you're in for my History Geek Fest the North Atlantic Ferry Route. And he's got plenty of historic geek fests, so buckle up. I do, I do. So I, I guess uh, first thing I should do is probably tell you what this is. It's basically a chain of small airfields, or relatively small, allowing shorter range aircraft to hop their way over the Atlantic. If you look at the route, it's very northerly, which um, depending on the type of map you're looking at may look like a longer way, but trust me, that's actually the short way. Uh, so the basic route from Presque Isle in Maine in the United States, you're going to go up to Goose Bay in Canada, across the Labrador Sea to Narsarswak, which is uh, at the time it would have been called Bluey West 1 in Greenland, onward to Reykjavik in Iceland. I hope I said that right. If you're from Iceland, feel free to drop in the comments how I should have said that. I think uh, Reykjavik is, is right. And, and we have Keflavik up there too, Air and, Force Base. Perfect. Uh, so off from Iceland to RAF Vegar, which is uh, now just Vegar Airport in the Faroe Islands. And I probably didn't say that one right either. And then finally down to Prestwick in Scotland. And by the time you've done that, you will have completed the North Atlantic Ferry Route. Well, that's all fun and dandy. Why did we even have that? I'm so glad you asked, Lee. All right. So uh, being, uh, a giant, <laughs> being a giant geek, um, when you watch all those World War II movies, if you've ever... Mm spent any time wondering how the aircraft got over there. Uh, basically, there are two options. Send it disassembled on a ship and assemble it uh, in the theater. Or you could fly it over. And uh, with all of the U-boat uh, issues in the Atlantic, you know, you, you could risk losing a ton of aircraft on a single torpedo strike. So Sending them over by air, which was at the time very challenging, turned out to be the more practical route despite the risks. Well, sure. And, and like you said, you know, if they were loading them, loading them onto ships, I mean, one U-boat would do a, you know, a not, not only just from a loss of equipment, but time. You know, who knows when the next uh, set of aircraft would be ready. Right. Well, and not only uh, that, I, I would assume from the manufacturer's standpoint, if I'm Curtis or any of the other companies that are putting together these aircraft, if I can mm. assemble it at the factory with my own crews, I know it's ready for you when I hand it to you. If I right, pack yeah. it on a ship in pieces, then we're down to uh, IKEA style aircraft. And, you know, the quality control on the assembly end, it could be, uh, it could vary a lot, but, but that's not, they weren't really worried about that. It was mostly the U-boat threat that said, okay, it's worth it. Let's try the air route. Sure, sure. Well, I'm sure the mechanics would have to have some type of training as well. I mean, they're going to be the ones working on it. So, um, you know, as with anything, they, they probably engineered some of that into it to make it easy because, you know, let's face it, it's not like assembling a you know, C-5 or a C-17 now uh, where, where we've come in aviation. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's much more... Uh, Simplistic, I guess. You, you know, sort of like having that old truck in your garage that you can actually pop the hood, identify every component and work on it versus a uh, modern vehicle where you pop the hood and there's a big plastic guard. that's like, don't even think about touching things. There's the battery and there's the wiper fluid. <laughs> now get it. Right. Here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, this route, actually the military just sort of adopted it. It was really being surveyed in the 1930s by uh, mm -hmm. civil commercial aviation. And so uh, I think a lot of the, the homework and the early survey legwork had been done. But uh, by 1941, the military essentially takes it over. 
And uh, the good thing for even the civilian sector is they dumped a lot of money into airport construction. Uh, sure. Very notably, i um, pretty sure Vagar and the Faroe Islands is, um, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, one of the construction projects. Uh, Bluey West, which is a Narsar Swak, is one of the construction projects. And there's others. They built uh, a couple more in Greenland. A couple have been just abandoned, left to, uh, left to rot. So who utilized these routes? Well, interestingly enough, that was one of the weird things when I started reading it. And I found a a mini series about it as well. And and it's not coming to the top of my head what that series is called. I'll put it in the video comments, guys. So look for it there. But it was Mm -hmm. really not uh, military pilots for the most part. It was pretty much all military aircraft, but it's mostly flown by civilian pilots. So uh, the U.S. had, I believe, Air Transport Command. The British had RAF Ferry Command, and a lot of mm-hmm. times they were picking up these civilian pilots from wherever they could because they needed their combat pilots in the European theater. And so this is a huge war effort, a very dangerous one, and most of the casualties are civilians. Right, and I believe, too, uh, unless I'm mistaken, the um, WASPs, the uh, Women's Air Service Pilots, I believe, let me... Uh... Yeah, or women's army service pilots or auxiliary service pilots. I guess there's a, a couple different um, terms there. But due to the shortage, like you said, of qualified pilots, they were actually enlisted in the first women aviators to deliver the aircraft that way as well. So um, just on the danger note, what's interesting with this mm-hmm. route is part of what makes it so darn dangerous is the limitations of the uh, aircraft of the late 30s and early 40s and uh, technologically we're going to really overcome that almost exactly at the end of the war I I believe I'd read they spent more money to develop the B-29 than they did on the Manhattan Project for the bomb the B-29 was going to drop and uh, the interesting thing if you ever get into the technical like compare B-17 to B-29 the B-29 so much more modern in so many ways. Now, just at a, at a profile, oh, they, they both look like old planes with props and whatnot, but it's really, uh, the B-29 is not going to have the issues with this route that a B-17 would. Sure, and it was pressurized and all that too, right? So, I mean, there was just a lot of... War was pushing the boundaries of what was possible. Bingo. So you, you've got one of them there. So pressurization gives you altitude. Altitude gives you clearance over weather terrain. and terrain. Yeah, yes, weather. both yep. of those are going to be big issues, especially Greenland. <laughs> so uh, sure, sure. this this route was running about a 10 percent loss rate. So uh, that shows you how serious the situation was that at one in 10 aircraft not making it, they're still like, yep, this is worth it. Um, right. usually they're closing it down in winter because the weather is just not going to cooperate. And so we're, uh, I believe I, th- I'm going to throw a map in here that shows all the ferry routes. They would move mm-hmm. to the South Atlantic route, which, uh, it, it's longer. So if you can go North, North is better, but did not an option. So, uh, modern day, we've got some, uh, some ways why this is not going to be as dangerous now, primarily the GPS. You should not get lost today because of GPS and uh, the main reason you might have gotten lost in the uh, 30s and 40s, you have massive magnetic deviation. So the compass mm-hmm. requires a ton of calculation. Uh, wind drift, also a problem. Uh, and the weather resources of the day would not have been as good. So you have those two strikes against you. And then your navigational hardware on board, you're just down to radios. And the, uh, the transmitters from the ground are so limited in range, you're going to spend a lot of time in uh, sort of radio blackout there and not be able to receive. So as you're making these huge Atlantic crossings, hitting those uh, point of no return on the fuel gauge, and you still don't have any radio bearing to anything, <laughs> you're just crossing your fingers and praying you're uh, heading to the right place. Well, and as with a lot of stuff, reliability changed. A lot of those were analog um you know, not the solid state instruments we use now, both on the ground, in the aircraft. And for people that fly general aviation airplanes, a lot of times those gauges are fairly unreliable even today. Right. You know, well, uh, yeah, the vacuum certified. system, vacuum system well, yeah. sucks. So. Yeah, yeah, that. And I think um, 
I, and I could be wrong here. I'd have to dig and look it up. But I believe as far as requirements for a gas gauge in your average Cessna Piper, it has to indicate that it's empty when it's empty. Okay. All right. So half might be half. It could be a third or three quarters. Oh, okay. I, you see what I, I'm saying? I say, yep, yep. It's calibrated to the zero, not to the other. Right. Okay. Well, so uh, we, we kind of dived into this topic without announcing it, but modern aircraft are still flying this route, and the main reason they would do it is uh, if you have general aviation and you want to cross the Atlantic, this is how you would do it. If you have general aviation and you want to sell it or purchase it from the other side of the Atlantic, this is also how you would do it. And um, even commercial aircraft, for example, like a uh, regional airliner or something, you know, accommodations have to be made to deliver those. And um, so this route is still in use today. It's just a little bit simpler because we have a better handle on the weather navigation hugely better and uh but but we've mitigated most of those risks with the modern technology so i guess since we're on aircraft let's, let's talk about what i'm actually going to use for this route if you want to recreate this in x plane and that's why i made this video i think just about anything will work the two i had in mind lee from uh my x plane hangar are the c45 expediter which is a military beach 18 or the c47 mm -hmm. which is the military sure. dc3 mm -hmm. um i don't know do you have any other thoughts of things that might be good to bring up here no i i think those are good options um the c47 dc3 whatever that is the aero works version which is free so anybody can fly that now you had the payware c45 and there's another one out there I think they have B twenty fives possibly. Oh right, there's so a, that might yeah. be another option. Th there's a payware B twenty five, and there's yeah. a free B seventeen, which I have, but uh, I don't know how to use it yet. So, okay, well there you go. If you want authentic, um, on the other hand, you know you could do uh, general aviation stuff. There's uh, occasionally we'll catch on Facebook some of the guys are doing round the world flights Ooh. and smaller planes yes and yes okay on that note in one of these legs we're, we're going to run you guys through my my recreation i went and ran all five legs for the experience and then i was filming and decided i gotta share this because it's too cool but on the way um between greenland and iceland you know i'm on project fly all, all i see over me are these massive airliners doing long haul and all of a sudden there's a little cessna icon Mm -hmm. You know, I'm proud of myself. I'm the only one out here braving the elements. And then if I click on the right. Cessna, I'm like, well, <laughs> hats off to There's you, sir. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on what Cessna, he might have been having, or he might have been flying about the same speed as you. Yeah, yeah, really. Crikey. All right. I mean, the, the C-47 DC-3 is not particularly fast. No, it, it's, a, it's a long trip in that bird. Um, so... Yeah. Let me tell you, kind of tell you the, the parameters for how I set this up. I tried mm -hmm. to go mostly slant alpha, which means uh, radio navigation, VORs, NDBs. I did that successfully for about 75% of the trip. There is a GPS included on the DC-3, but here's the cool thing. It's hidden, meaning you can set it up and then close it back out and only refer to it in an emergency, which is how I used it. There were times I intentionally didn't let myself check it just to kind of have that experience, but... Uh, you didn't cheat and use the map, did you? Don't look at the map. Don't look at the GPS. Let's just completely dead reckon and find our way. And it, it I'll tell you, it raises the stress level. Oh, sure. And this harassment is actually for your guys' enjoyment because uh, Tim and I were having discussions. When did you actually fly this? Probably about three weeks, four weeks before we're recording this now. Yeah. Um, I've had the footage for a while cause we, uh, we were working on the, of, uh, uh, the new, uh, just flight Vulcan for FS elite. So go check out that video. It's a, uh, it's a fantastic video and a fantastic aircraft, but it put this onto the back burner. So now this is, uh, getting done, but I think, I think what Lee's about to reveal to you is one of my bad habits. <laughs> Right. So we, we have this saying, as many of you subscribers and frequent watchers uh, may know, as plan the flight and fly the plan. And I think Tim has on numerous occasions, I don't know, live stream or other videos where we've gotten together. He has admitted to feeling a little bit guilty about not living by that. Yeah, sometimes so, I, what, what, what would I say I do? I fly the flight 
while planning a plan <laughs> in midair. Maybe there's a, there's been a few where we're like, hey, um, here's a question I have for you, and you're like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I got in the plane. Yeah, Lee's like, what were the winds aloft? I'm like, right. Uh, they were there. Or what's the weather supposed to be when we get there? I don't know. <laughs> All right. So, well, well, walk us through that because. All right. In order to recreate this, and you you use live weather on this too, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, right, as we normally do. So what um, what did you change about preparing for these legs versus normal to, to somebody who might not be familiar with doing that? Well, I, I got about four things I did. Uh, first off, started with Sky Vector. Uh, rather than uh, Sky Vector has all the maps for free. You're going to see a lot of them in here, skyvector.com. Normally, if I was on an airliner, grab SimBrief. It's going to do all the heavy lifting for me. But SimBrief is going to brief you a modern style flight plan with a lot of GPS. And, and you can you can start there and work your way back. But I really kind of wanted to do it by hand because, again, I'm on a low and slow aircraft. I wanted time to look at the charts because mountain ranges are a problem. So start with Sky Vector. Uh, Can I interject real quick on that? Go for it. Did you by chance use uh, Navigraph? Because you know on Navigraph, a lot of times we use the high altitude ones because we fly the airliners or whatever, mm -hmm. but they have the low altitude charts for below um, 18,000 feet. Oh, well, I just learned something. No, um, I used Navigraph in flight for okay. uh, you know the plates, the approach plates, departures, airport charts, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I did not use Navigraph in the planning phase. Ah, oh, missed out. Just kidding. All right. So for weather, now this this is the one main one Lee teases me on. I actually did try and plan for weather, and I probably didn't do a very good job. But uh, using windy dot com, you can put in the ICAO codes and get the weather and uh, terminal area forecasts. Now, just disclaimer: the real world and X plane, even using you know match conditions to real world. There's a pretty substantial degree of variation there. Have you found that, Lee? To be precise, yes, but I I think the overall weather picture it captures. You okay. know, as far as Fair lower enough. ceilings and, you know, some your winds may be a few, you know, thirty or forty degrees off, but you know, if you've got low ceilings or broken layers, I find that that tends to be fairly accurate. Yeah, the margin of difference is not so big that it's like, oh, well, in Windy, it was a go, but in X-Plane, it's a no-go. It wasn't, it wasn't that far off, but it, yeah. was, um, it was not exactly the same. Like, I would not take my altimeter reading from Windy and fly it in X-Plane. You know, use Windy for planning, but in X-Plane, still tune up ATIS, still pool the ground resources as needed uh so so next thing magnetic deviation because we're so far north you know the, the compass is it's not useless but it can lead you astray and um i don't really know how to calculate magnetic deviation i read a lot on it while i was doing this trip actually it's what i did during cruise most of the time so I found the Navlog feature on uh, skyvector.com will do the magnetic deviations for you per leg. And uh, so it, it's going to help you adjust a heading that would be corrected for that deviation. The main issue being, even with that, each of the waypoints you hit are so far apart that the deviation is changing en route and uh, so that, that makes that one really very tricky, particularly between Greenland and Iceland. And then last, fuel estimates. Actually, this was pretty simple. Uh, the fuel estimates, I just took the time estimated by Skyvector, and I went on into X-Plane and used uh, its estimate off of its fuel setup, and that seemed to work all right. So didn't have any issues there. Is that the thing where you uh, where you load the fuel up in the plane through the regular configurator yeah, and just, it says yep. three hours and 30 minutes or whatever? That's exactly what I used. Now, I will okay. tell you, I flew light. I only uh, only had about, I think, 1,600 pounds. We'll see it on some of the loadout menus I include here. Mm -hmm. But I, I did it as though it was only, you know, a token crew and maybe a little bit of stuff. Okay, so... Um, Bam, let's get into this. 
first leg, easiest leg. It's from Presque Isle in Maine up to Goose Bay. This is really where the route would start, at least domestically. You know, granted, it obviously had to get from factories frequently in California, but uh, we're not really including that here. So uh, this is pretty much an overland. You're going to fly over some water, but it's not extensive, like engine out, you're going in the drink type thing. There's plenty of nav sources along the way. I don't believe at any point I was out of uh, radio contact with the ground transmitter. So we'll show that to you on the Sky Vector. And generally speaking, I found this to be a great warm-up leg. So if you, if you like, you just download the DC-3, want to try this, this is going to be a good figure out how to use the aircraft. Uh, it took me 2 hours and 34 minutes. We flew 494 nautical miles, and we burnt 637 kilograms of fuel, which uh, if you want to do pounds, multiply times 2.2. Uh, you know, and on that warm-up leg with that airplane the biggest thing i found and i can't remember i think we may have discussed this on our little podcast thing was the um is just setting up that magnetic compass autopilot heading thing once oh. you work through that most of the airplane is intuitive yeah that is weird uh in the center panel right is that the one you're talking about yeah that one in the center where it's like a it, it's like a two-part almost but Tim did a good job explaining that and showing that in our video, which oh, will that's be right. we have a tutorial. linked. That's right. Yeah, you did a that. tutorial on it. Yeah. Yeah, check that out. It's good stuff. A lot of people watch it. That's one of our uh, like top ten videos. Yeah, for sure. All right. So leg two. This is the big one. This is actually why I flew the route. Uh, this is the second time I've done this. I did it once in the expediter like a year ago, and I think I did the GPS, so I cheated that time. But this is a pretty infamous leg. Uh, and a lot of it's because the topography of Greenland at Narsarswak is, it's epic. You've got these deep fjords. Um, the weather is not always very forgiving. And a lot of the aircraft that are going to do this are committed because they're out of fuel. They're, there's a point of no return. And so they have to find this airport or... You know, there's really not good ditching options up here, although it's been done. Uh, I think, Lee, didn't you tell me you, you ran across at least two stories recently on that? I mean, they're not recent stories, but... Right, yeah, yeah. It was, um, well, Glacier Girl, the uh, P-38 that was restored to airworthy condition, uh, went down in Greenland, and a B-29 called Keybird um, also went down there. That aircraft was, uh, recovery was attempted more recently in the 2000s, I believe, or uh, 1990s, and then the aircraft was uh, subsequently lost. Right. Now, that's a cool story. You guys should look it up if you're a history geek like me. Um, I mean, it's tragic because they didn't get the aircraft out, and they put a lot of work into it, but that's Keybird, mm -hmm. a B-29. And uh, Glacier Girl, I feel like I've heard of that when visiting the uh, Plains of Fame museums. Is that one of theirs? Um, I don't remember. I mean, for a while it was. It wouldn't it was touring. surprise me because they're uh, they're also in the business of keeping largely operational aircraft, not just uh, static museum pieces. All right, well let's get let's get back to the trip here. Um, so I was actually stressing about this leg because it's just it's just challenging we had watched uh how do you say that guy's name is it matt Gunthmiller? Gunthmiller. guff miller um we were watching him on one of those dc3 ferry uh flights out to england for the uh d-day uh anniversary and he's on there with serious professional high hour pilots i think one of them's a 747 captain and and you can just sense as they're en route uh, there's tension over the icing they're getting there's there's tension over the weather uh they had to do a position report uh just radioing in the blind catch anybody they did find somebody to bounce that off of and then uh, even when they get in there to make the approach i mean they're just super super cautious and uh it's just interesting because you can see these are seasoned pilots and they, they took it very seriously and they, they treat it with the respect that a professional treats something dangerous with. So it really was like, oh, I got to try this now. 
Actually, he has a video on his channel, uh, Matt Guffmiller, and it's called Crossing the Atlantic Ocean in a 30s Airliner, and that's when they're flying that DC-3. Okay, so that's the one, yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. video. Uh, I love that uh, Pan Am recreated livery and the interior. That's just a beautiful aircraft. Sure, sure. So uh, we'll, we'll throw up here the, the route, but as you can see, as I'm departing Goose Bay, I've got basically one last transmitter at the coast. Uh, that's uh, NDBJC. And then I've got 547 nautical miles over open water, the Labrador Sea, until SI. And SI is an NDB. It's medium power, meaning it only puts out signal for about 25 nautical miles. So uh, the reason I'm stressing is I'm thinking, okay, if you're off by one degree over 547 miles, you know, how many miles have you drifted? If you're off by two degrees, how many miles have you, you know, your margin of error here is 25 miles. That's it. So, uh, to, to a given element of realism, I, I've tracked, uh, JC behind me as I was outbound as far as I could track it till I lost it. Then I, I, I think I did like one last GPS check when I, when I thought I was about midway, mostly mm -hmm. because I didn't want to have to refly the whole thing. So I was like, okay, yeah, right. if, if I'm in the middle of the Labrador sea about roughly on course, we'll proceed and I'll stop looking at the GPS checked out. I was approximately where I thought I should have been Stop looking at the GPS. So then I'm flying along and I'm watching the time and I'm watching the fuel and I'm looking at the horizon. I don't know. Don't see anything. And my time estimates are telling me we should be getting somewhere. So I'm like, oh, this is like, you know, if I'm if I'm too far south, I could completely miss Greenland. But I'm thinking that's probably right, not likely. Yeah. If I'm too far north, then I have the issue. I guess even if I'm how far north and where am I? Yeah, <laughs> even if I'm like 26 miles south. Then if you right. hit the coast and you don't pick up the transmitter, now you got to guess, do I go left or do I go right? And if I do and I don't get the transmitter, how far should I fly before I turn around? I mean, like, <laughs> you have some serious mm -hmm. life and death guesswork to do. So uh, right about the time I'm starting to think, okay, what's the game plan if I, if I don't find this transmitter? Uh, just then I was actually looking at the indicator and bam, it picks up the uh, NDB. So I'm relieved. A couple moments later, start picking up the coast. And then uh, the booger with an NDB, since you don't have radials like a VOR, I know which way it is to it, but I don't know how far it is to it. And I don't have a radial with which to project where I'm actually freaking at. And it's very frustrating. Sure, yeah. So uh, I don't know if... I. I I know I've sent you the footage, but it's like a pile of junk and you probably can't necessarily find it. But I've got the map of Project Fly at the end. I went back and captured the image and I, I'm looking at the VFR charts and I'm looking at the coast and I'm waiting for this inlet. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they all look the same. And uh, the main thing I'm, I'm looking to find is there's a secondary NDB farther up, but it's even lesser powered. So pretty much until you hit that first NDB SI, you probably can't really pick up NS, which is the next one that leads you up the fjord. So oh, I, okay. I made one false turn in, decided pretty quickly, uh, I'm just heading for glaciers. So turned back to the coast and continued down. Eventually did pick up um, NS, which was the uh, the next one. And I was just bouncing back and forth between SI and NS's frequency, just trying, like, okay, where, do I, where am I at? Because I didn't want to lose track of the uh, the one I had. Right. When I finally caught NS, I um, began to get a visual picture of where I'm at because I, I knew from the charts where it should be. And I actually saw it on the ground. So I descend into the fjord, and we'll get some uh, shots here of it flying up the fjord. And it's pretty intimidating because you think to yourself, you know, if I had some cloud cover here, <laughs> this could be a catastrophe. And it wouldn't take much. Um, you know how you can get those clouds that just kind of sit in mountain ranges? Sure. Yeah. Like 
I believe that's called mountain obscuration. Like, that would just be, you know, to get all this way and to fly into this fjord and, and you've got NDBs, which are not nearly as precise as you'd like to be, and you're just praying you don't smash into a mountain. It was, it's awful. But uh, uh-huh. I got lucky. I had good visibility. So I finally come around the last turn, pick up the runway, and, you, and you'll see here it's got a weird upslope. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Uh, I have X-Plane set to my runway's contour to the terrain. The question is, is X-Plane's terrain spot on or not? I don't know. Right. But, How uh, accurate is the terrain mesh? Yeah, there there are times when I'm definitely like, okay, that, that can't be right. That's absurd, mm-hmm. but I don't know about this one. So, got it on the ground, safe and sound. It was... Uh, it's pretty good. Block time for this leg, four hours and 57 very stressful minutes, 674 nautical miles. I think this is actually the longest leg. And we uh, went through 896 kilograms of fuel. That's interesting how long that leg was and you, own, well, I was going to say you only burned a little bit more fuel than the first leg, but uh, I guess it's about, what, 20% more? Hmm. I, I didn't even think about that. And you know what? For a trip that's twice as long uh, time-wise. In retrospect, I don't know what the winds are on either of those trips, so I don't know if I was fighting. Right. Um, but I was flying these at about uh, 10,000 feet, mm-hmm. which for a non-pressurized aircraft is about as fuel-sipping of an altitude as it's going to get to. Yeah, and I don't know if the uh, aviation... Um aviation weather was it like aviationweather.gov or whatever that's where i go to get my like winds aloft um forecasts and that kind of stuff i don't know if they cover this far north you know I, like yeah. i don't know how much they encompass their and uh, compile their data but uh yeah who knows I, I don't know how polar winds work up there yeah i have no idea well speaking of polar uh when we start leg three the real weather, again, is set on, and I get this snowy departure, so I got some nice shots of that. As much as X-Plane does a bad job of showing seasonal snow in northern areas where you should have it, it does actually do a pretty nice job with actual falling snow and those uh, those like wind drifts that float across the ground. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing those all the time when I was in uh, Pennsylvania. You, know, you get that light dusting of snow, the wind catches it, and you get those little swirls Uh, x-plane does that beautifully all right so interestingly enough departing narsarswak has some of the exact same problems as entering uh it's kind of a one way in one way out sort of deal especially in a dc3 uh we just don't have the climb power these fjords are the exact same issue getting in and i'm going to have the same issue getting out so when i take off i'm using those same ndbs and i'm backtracking back towards canada briefly until I have enough altitude, so I'm watching all of the VFR charts and everything for where's the mountains at. Then when I finally got to altitude, turned a course, now we're heading for Iceland. Uh, I had fuel on board for 5 hours and 19 minutes. I've got an image to throw up there for that. Had some of the same concerns about weather and visibility because you know, I just don't have a lot of good diversion options on this route. And as you look out the window here, it's going to be... It's just absolutely gorgeous, but the whole thing is like mountains and glaciers, so <laughs> the idea of putting down here sucks. It would just not be fun to uh, have to wait for somebody to come and find you if they could even get to you. Uh, good things, though, as we get out towards Iceland, Iceland has much better navigational aids on the ground, so that makes it easier. I did program the GPS before departure, so it can be cross-checked, but uh, hit it most of the time. I did try and do check-ins with the GPS, not to cheat on my course, but to work the magnetic deviation. This area, I saw a chart of the world magnetic deviations, and this area of, of Greenland, between Greenland and Iceland, has some of the most fluctuations that you're going to find on the map. So it's just absolutely awful to try and use the magnetic compass. So Mm. about every 10 minutes, I tried to check in with the GPS and basically just to tweak my compass. That's really all I was going for. Uh, Had some visible precipitation. So we have some icing concerns, you know, these old aircraft frequently didn't have anything. Um, 
I believe DC3s, it's kind of hit or miss on the ones around today. If anybody added de-icing boots or heating or... Uh, aren't there prop fluids they can spray to de-ice the props? That- yeah, some of them, I think, they had heating elements. And then, like, now uh, some companies have... I think they call it TKS, which is like a glycol um, antifreeze solution that kind of weeps out and, oh, okay. and blows back. All right. Or, the, yeah, they have a, a slinger on the prop. So uh, this is actually where I passed the Cessna when I was all proud that I'm up here braving it in a DC-3. And then I see on Project Fly, I'll throw out the image. So if you're Max Schnee, if, if I'm saying your screen name right, and you were flying that Cessna 172, hats off to you, sir. And you should comment <laughs> on this video because yes. I, I was impressed. I don't know if anybody else saw you, but I was impressed. And if you made a video of this, uh, please leave that link down there so we can go check it out. Wouldn't that be funny? Uh, so, yeah. So, let's see what else is interesting here. So, once we get out to sea, pretty much nothing to see. Watch the fuel. Watch the compass. Check in the nav. Hope you end up in the right place. Uh, <laughs> I did make it to Iceland. Not very exciting when I arrived. Uh, block time, four hours, seven minutes. 667 nautical miles, burning 756 kilograms of fuel. So we're in about the same ballpark again. And uh, I don't know what happened. It's funny because I can actually vividly remember my arrival. And Mm -hmm. I think I flew over Keflavik and then turned up to uh, Reykjavik. They're, They're very close to each other. It's funny. I can see it all in my mind. I can't find the footage. So I don't know if I lost it, guys, but sorry. Nice. Go fly it yourself. You'll see it. Yeah. Oops. There, yeah, there you go. Lee suspects a bad landing, but I have the Project Fly to show you that I didn't plunk it in because you'll see it on there. <laughs> well, that's okay. The few times I've flown the DC-3, I've... Uh, well, they're not terrible, but they're definitely not the best landings. Oh. Well, practice makes perfect, as so they say. That's true. So, uh, getting out of here, the next leg... I, You know, I didn't know anything about this. Honestly, I... I'm sorry to say this, guys. I didn't know the Faroe Islands existed until I was flying this. So I'm pleased to have learned something new because they seem really interesting. Um, The next stop is from Reykjavik down to Vegar, if I said that right. It was a former RAF base, and they built it. And I I think this is cool. They picked a piece of land where you couldn't see it from the ocean because they were really afraid of all of the uh, warships transiting the North Atlantic at that point that, you know, They didn't want it to be bombarded by a battleship and removed from service. Now, that plays slightly into the interesting approach I'm going to have. So I timed this one to land after dark because, honestly, I was getting a little bored. I've been in the DC-3 for now hours and hours and hours and days and weeks, and um, I wanted to see some, some darkness. So I planned the flight so I would arrive in the dark, and I did. And uh, here's the crazy thing. On the approach, and I got the chart off Navigraph, and it called for 3,700 feet. I came in at 2,000. Now, I um, did check. I know. <laughs> knock it off. What, I know. I know. <laughs> wait, wait, what was what was 3,700 feet? That was where, uh, that was the charted altitude for the approach plate. Okay. And you, I was at 2,000. One thousand seven hundred. You know what exists, right? Yeah, Okay. But I'm not I'm a commercial done. airliner. I know. So I did actually check. Uh, the only obstruction was on the approach. There's a 1,837 foot island slash mountain, if you will, in the approach. Mm-hmm. And the approach is basically a fjord, sort of. And this mountain's kind of sitting out the front like a like a guardian. And you come directly over it. There's a transmitter on top of it, I think, actually. And Mm -hmm. the crazy thing is, so I've been flying in the dark now for like an hour or two, and I have on the landing lights, I'm running my approach list. I know I have 163 feet if my altimeter is set correctly between me and the obstruction. and Narrow margin, sir. That's what, a couple wingspans? Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, Well, I see, I, I immediately had time to reconsider that because... I can see the airport lights way out there, so I know I'm getting close. And all of a sudden, my landing lights pick up the ground, and I've got a shot of this. And just, because, you know, the the landing lights are 
tilted down somewhat. So I, I pick mm-hmm. up terrain as the way they're hitting it, the terrain is sloping up and up and up. And you, I just get this perception. It's just going to keep going up until it's in my windscreen and blam end of flight. Yeah, so, yeah. so sorry, Charlie. Uh, fortunately the altimeter was correct and I passed over it, but I was like, Oh wow. Small heart attack there. So, uh, yeah, I guess next time I will do the 3,700 feet. I, I think the reason I chose 2,000 is the, getting this thing to descend at the speeds I wanted and everything. I just didn't want to have to burn off all of that altitude. But, uh, right. yeah, I think I was probably wrong. So uh, we'll get a better <laughs> look at that uh, rock as I depart in the in the morning. Okay, so we'll get some footage. But that leg was three hours and five minutes, 416 nautical miles. And a fuel sipping, 542 kilograms of fuel. All right, and now, if you stuck with us, guys, the last leg. Vagar to Prestwick, Scotland. So we're finally arriving in uh, not continental Europe, but uh, I think we'll certainly call England Europe for the sake of World War II purposes. European theater. There you go. So we've got a morning departure. And uh, you're going to see in this footage, the airport's really tucked into this terrain. And the approach I flew in the night before is down the fjord between terrain. And uh, the only bonkers thing, again, this could be one of those weird terrain mesh following problems. As I taxi out, it's a massive down, down slope to the actual threshold. Like I was on the brakes, a little worried the DC three would get ahead, get away from me, and roll down into the ocean. It was just bizarre. But hmm. um, took off, spun around. I'm gonna include some footage. I come back out over uh, that uh, mountain. It has a name. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. It's on the Navigraph chart. And uh, then I turned back to Scotland. I did let this leg. I got lazy. By the end, I let the GPS take me the whole way in. And uh, Scotland was beautiful, arriving in 3 hours and 39 minutes, 402 nautical miles on this leg, 658 kilograms of fuel burned. I couldn't really fault you for finally running a GPS there on the back end, because you toughed it out. You earned that. Well, and really, it's one of those, you're overpopulated. Like, it wasn't one of those, it's open ocean where, oh, this is a hard one. I mean... Probably by the time I hit uh, Northern Scotland, could have grabbed a VFR chart and gotten there. So did did you say that that Vagar was the one that had a pretty interesting slope? Uh, Vagar had a slope I find highly unlikely to be realistic. And uh, there was also a decent amount of slope at Narsarswak that's probably at a minimum slightly exaggerated. Mm -hmm. But... uh, I don't know. There are some bonkers ones out there. Like, uh, what is that? Tell you ride has that, uh, yeah, that dip in the middle. So, I mean, every time you find well, something weird in X plane, it, it might not be inaccurate. Well, I'm looking right now on the Navigraph chart at, um, uh, what is it? Vagar. And the airfield reference point is in the middle of the airport. And, that's usually where your, uh, elevation is taken. Right. That's 280 feet. All right, what's the touchdown have, zone? You have um, elevations at each threshold of 264 feet for 1-2 and 235 feet for 3-0. So there's really not that much. It looks like okay. it comes, your, your high point's the middle. All right, so X-Plane is definitely like, I can't, Maybe a little off yeah, <laughs> you'll see in the, the video footage. Whew, yeah, it was bonkers. All right, Sim Captain. So uh, you might have noticed this is a very different video. We do have some historic trips, but myself and about ten people have watched them, like my Pan Am series. So uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you'll try it. It's an epic trip, but we'd really love some feedback. So if you try it, get on here, let us know how you did. We do watch the comments religiously. We will get back to you. Mm-hmm. Um, if you hated this video and just want to razz me and tell me I should get back to tutorials, you can throw that in there. Just say it politely. <laughs> hey, we, we have to fly planes from time to time, though, too, right? Not every video can be a tutorial. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just want to fly planes. Well, um, you know, in the fun of it, I need a reason to do something. Like, if I don't have an interesting thought, I won't sim. 
I, I almost have to be like, oh, I want to fly over this thing, or I need to go to that place, or I want to recreate this, or I just saw this aircraft, I have to fly it now. And so that's why um, watching um, a couple things I read and that Matt uh, Gunth Miller's video, uh, you know, just amped me up. Oh, I have to do this now. And so I hope we can get you guys excited. By the way, speaking of which, the livery, November 341 mm-hmm. Alpha. That's an interesting aircraft. It's a real aircraft. It's um, it's a restored DC-3. Go look up that number. You'll find more information than I care to convey to you here. But uh, I thought it was a very fitting one to use and uh, looked good for this. So November 341 Alpha, check it out. Well, and also, if you stuck around this far, if you know of any other historic or interesting flights... Let us know in the comments, not only just for us, I mean, because we may recreate them as well, and who knows, turn them into a video, but um, you know, for other people. Again, this this channel, we try and do this stuff for you guys, the community. Um, if you geek out like we do, cool. If you just hit us in, in passing, that's fine too. But, you know, share with the community. We want, we want you guys to be able to be involved with us. Absolutely. Well, again, we're the Flight Brothers. I'm Tim. And I'm Lee. And uh, even though I don't always do it, remember, you should plan the flight. And then fly the plan and not into mountains. (laughs) And do fly the charted altitudes at all times. Yes. All right. Later.